In 2002, a letter arrived at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch newspaper from a man claiming to be a serial killer. The letter included a map with an X marking the spot where he left one of his victims. But the map told forensic scientists a lot more than just the location of a body. It was their key to finding the killer. Just across the river from St. Louis, Missouri, is a town called East St. Louis in Illinois, where prostitutes sell their wares, often to finance their drug addictions. 34-year-old Elisa Greenwade was one of those caught in a hopeless cycle. It's rough when you see somebody that you care about and you feel helpless. In April of 2001, Elisa Greenwade's body was discovered in Washington Park, Illinois, where she had been strangled, and there were ligature marks on her wrists and ankles. A tire impression was found near her body, which was photographed for analysis. It was identified as a Bridgestone Potenza tire. Just days later, police find three more bodies, all known prostitutes. The victims were just displayed. They were laid out right in the open, right off the side of roadways. But on one of the victims, police found some evidence. There was no drag marks on the body, but there was a large tire impression on Betty James' leg. This tire impression was from a Goodrich Advantage tire, different than the tire impression found at the earlier crime scene. Over the next five months, Three more bodies were found dumped along the streets of East St. Louis. Rape test kits from two of the victims yielded biological samples which were sent for testing. The St. Louis Police Department was convinced that the same individual committed all the murders since the crimes were committed in the same manner. The victims were positioned, there was obvious uh, a disregard for any type of uh, secrecy, any type of cover-up, anything like that. It, it was an obvious th these were secondary locations. Six months after the first murder, the crime stopped. Time went on and no more bodies appeared. We figured either th three things. Uh, the subject was in custody, he died or moved out of the area. St. Louis police called the FBI for further assistance. Special agent Melanie Jimenez was assigned to the case. I was trying to compile the information so that I could get a package together to send to our behavioral sciences unit at Quantico. I wanted the profilers there to take a look at it and try to give us a profile of who they thought this person was. Bob Morton was the behavioral profiler working on this case. He knew immediately that these murders would be difficult to solve. There's no connection other than a business, if you will, transaction between the customer and the prostitute. And that anonymity gives him that blanket to just go in and come out. Most crime is between the races. So if, if, I'm, if you have a black victim, most of the time you have a black offender. For three months, the killer wasn't heard from. But inexplicably, the murders started again. Over the next five months, three more bodies were found dumped along the streets of East St. Louis. Verona Thompson, Yvonne Cruz, and Brenda Beasley. The death toll was now at 10. Bill Smith covered this story for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch newspaper. One of his stories profiled Teresa Wilson, one of the victims of the serial killer. What I think I ended up doing was humanizing um, this woman who, um, in a way, had, had kind of dehumanized her own life by getting involved in prostitution and drug activities. And it wasn't long before Smith got a piece of fan mail. It was a letter from the killer.
days after Bill Smith's article on slain prostitute Teresa Wilson appeared in the newspaper, he received an anonymous letter. It had a very unusual return address. I noticed also that the uh, postage stamp in the upper right-hand corner was upside down. I started to read it, and I thought it was a joke. I thought it was somebody basically just yanking my chain. Dear Bill, nice sob story about Teresa Wilson. Write one about Greenweight. Write a good one, and I'll tell you where many others are. To prove I'm real, here's directions to number 17. Search in a 50-yard radius from the X. Put the story in the Sunday paper like the last. I think he got aggravated, and I think he wanted to somehow show us that these, in fact, were not human beings that we were dealing with, and that he had some kind of a right to do what he was doing. The letter referenced 17 murders, although police only knew of 10. The return address included the words, I Thraldom, a bondage website. Along with the letter was a map of a remote area along Highway 67, which was marked with an X. Smith turned the letter over to the authorities. There's a lot of taunting in a letter like that. He's very proud of himself. He feels that he's smarter than everybody else because he can send this letter and he can get credit for what he did. Uh, that was the first thing that came in my mind is that, you know, he's looking for attention. When police searched the area described in the map, they discovered the remains of another victim. Now there was no doubt the letter came from the killer. But who wrote the letter, and where did it come from? The return address said New York, but the postmark revealed the letter was mailed in St. Louis. Both the letter and the map were printed from a computer. The map had been cropped to remove any copyright notices from the map company. It had to take a lot of time. He does not want to expose himself by going to a public library, a Kinko's, or wherever else you can get access to a computer. This is something you're going to do at home that you can print out. Not only that, he printed it on the same kind of paper that the letter was on. This man is an intelligence agent with the Illinois State Police. Due to the sensitive nature of his job, we cannot reveal his identity. It was his job to perform the tedious process of finding the owner or copyright holder of that map. He compared the map to every CD-ROM and internet site that provides maps and directions. After hours of searching, he found the map used by the killer. It was on an internet service called Expedia.com. Expedia said that Microsoft provided the maps for use on their site. The map was proprietary, meaning that Expedia was the only site which offered that map and no one else. The FBI wanted to know the identity of everyone who had accessed this St. Louis map between the day the newspaper article appeared, May 19th, and the postmark of the letter, which was May 21st. It gave us a four to five day window of opportunity to see when that map had been accessed over the internet. When served with the subpoena, Microsoft analyzed their computer download records and discovered that only one computer had downloaded that map during that four day period. And the size of the downloaded map was identical to the map sent to the newspaper. But investigators needed to know the location of the computer. Microsoft couldn't identify the individual by name, only by what is called an IP number. So investigators performed what they call an IP reversal process, the same technique used to find child pornographers. The IP address, which is four sets of numbers separated by periods, identifies a particular computer's location on the internet. Computers linked to a network through a fixed connection typically have a permanent IP address, while computers that access the internet with a dial-up service are assigned an IP address for each session. To find the location of this particular IP user, the FBI turned to WorldCom, which provides the dial-up connection from computer to server. 
WorldCom's investigation revealed that the map was downloaded at 7.36 p.m. Central Time on May 20th from the Expedia site through the MSN online service. The map was downloaded by someone using the screen name Maury Travis. It did appear to be an individual's actual name. However, I knew that that didn't necessarily mean it was his true identity. The home was in Ferguson, a quiet middle-class suburb just outside of St. Louis. It was owned by a 55-year-old woman who had no prior criminal record. Investigators suspected the homeowner wasn't a killer, but who had access to her computer? Forensic computer search discovered that the map sent to the local newspaper revealing the location of a murder victim had been downloaded by a computer in this home. Investigators decided to have a look inside. I knocked. I said, FBI, we have a search warrant. I announced at least three times. Eventually, a man and a woman answered the door. He was mad. He was in a pair of boxer shorts. The first thing out of his mouth was, it's 7 o'clock in the morning. And you're right, it's 7 o'clock in the morning. And we're serving a federal search warrant. Okay, why are you here? And our response was, you know why we're here. He dropped his head. He said, yeah, I know why you're here. Inside, police found a computer, women's wigs and shoes, a stun gun, and a collection of homemade videotapes. The basement was spattered with blood. The ceiling, walls, doors, and carpet, even the furniture. The man identified himself as 36-year-old Maury Travis, a restaurant worker who had served time for a string of armed robberies. His mother owned the home, but didn't live there. The woman was Travis's longtime girlfriend, who told police she had never been in the basement of the house. She didn't have any idea what was going on in that house, and he didn't want her to know. Next to the desk was a file cabinet. We broke into that cabinet and found a knapsack in there, and the knapsack was, we referred to it as a working bag, and there was duct tape, ligatures, straps uh, to tie victims up, a hose-type stocking that he used as gloves. Forensic scientists gathered samples of the blood in the basement for analysis. It was a mixture from six different individuals. No one ever seen any activity or anything around that house, and so it's just pretty scary. You think your neighborhood is really safe, and you don't know who your next-door neighbor is. Investigators found several drafts of the letter sent to the newspaper on his computer's hard drive. They also found two cars at the house. On one of the cars was a Goodrich Advantage tire that matched the tire impression left on Betty James' leg. A tire on the other car was a Bridgestone Potenza, which matched the tire impression near Elisa Greenwade's body. Travis was taken to St. Louis Police Department headquarters. He did not talk about the crimes, and actually we didn't ask him about any of the crimes. Our concern was attempting to get him to cooperate with us to take us to more victims. He claimed in his letter that there were 17 victims. Our concern, of course, was to find the rest of the victims. I have never interviewed anybody like that. His entire world circled around him. He was in control. He wanted to be the focus of everything and he had no remorse, no nothing. He, he was, the only way you can say it, he, he is a monster. He is just pure evil. During questioning, he asked for a soda. Later on, when we went to another interview room, I had the soda can taken to the lab. Mary Beth Carr swabbed the area near the opening for epithelial cells in Travis's saliva, which could be used for DNA testing. 
when Travis's DNA profile was compared to the biological material found on two of the murder victims, Yvonne Cruz and Brenda Beasley, Travis's DNA matched. Eventually, Travis asked police how they found him. We told him, well, there was a computer inquiry made over the Internet. And he cussed a couple times and had some nice words to say about the Internet. And then he cussed again about his computer. And he was very, very upset. I don't think he realized what he had done once he did that. And it dawned on him. It hit him like a ton of bricks. During questioning, Travis refused to reveal the locations of any of his other victims. Before police could question him again, there was another murder, which would end the investigation forever. On June 7, 2002, Maury Troy Travis was charged with kidnapping and murder. The homemade videotapes discovered in Travis's home showed Travis socializing with various women. But one videotape contained horrendous images, the likes of which police had never seen before. There's even an actual murder. I mean, he, you witness him actually killing one of these people. What was going on inside his head, why he did what he did, that's how I look at it, trying to figure out what, what makes a person do this. Investigators also found plans in Travis's home to expand his basement dungeon. He was planning on building a two-cell holding tank in his basement. He had ordered more handcuffs and leg shackles through the internet. He was even getting bids on expanding his basement to put the secret dungeon in. Only God knows how far this would have gone. Based on the computer's forensic evidence, investigators believe that Travis enjoyed reading the articles about his crimes in the newspaper. Police will say that these men live vicariously through the media sometimes after uh, their crimes are committed. Um, so they can take the newspaper article or they can take the TV show or whatever it might be and, um, and they can relive their crime and get a kind of a high from, from that also. And on the night of May 20th, Travis typed his letter to journalist Bill Smith. At 7.36 p.m., he visited the Expedia.com site, looking for a map he could use to show authorities where they could find one of his victims. After downloading the map, he carefully cropped the copyright notices from around the map, thinking this would eliminate the possibility of tracing it. But he was wrong. The map was as good as a fingerprint, in this case, a computer fingerprint. Maury Travis was taken to prison to await trial. He was placed under a 24-hour suicide watch where guards check on him every 15 minutes. He didn't want to go back to the penitentiary. He made that very clear to us. I'm not going back to the penitentiary, and you're not going to give me the needle. For whatever reason, guards skipped two back-to-back -back checks. It was all the time Travis needed to hang himself in his cell without ever admitting guilt or leading police to the bodies of his other victims. This is where he was found hanging. They had let him literally slip right through their fingers. To say that I was angry and to say that people in the newsroom were angry about it and that the community was angry about it is really an understatement. I think people, I think people were furious and the families of those women should have been furious. Um, that absolutely no way should have ever been allowed to happen. When Mr. Travis hung himself, he took all the answers with him. We have a million questions. I think it's amazing that it's such an incredible tool that through analyzing the computer, we were able to catch someone that was committing crimes like this. Had anybody said, hey, the guy's going to send you a map, 
and for the investigators to be able to backtrack to him never thought that in my wildest dreams it, it's almost like him saying okay here's a map and this is how you find me x marks the spot how many times does that really happen it doesn't